Let's go to work. Galatians. Yeah, it's a mess. It's a mess. I, I didn't. This was more clean than the other side. So. Galatians uh, chapter four, we're going to just very shortly uh, finish up where we left off last week, which was verses 21 through 31. And we're going to finish off uh, with two covenants. And then we'll get directly into Christian liberty. All right. Galatians chapter four, again, verses 21 through 31. It finishes off uh, with two covenants. And then once we uh, enter and open the door to chapter five, uh, the apostle Paul will start off with Christian liberty. Very, 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 very powerful. Uh, just to give us a quick backdrop for those that may be new or may not be uh, listening to us online through social media. Remember what the apostle Paul has been battling ever since the beginning of this letter that he's written to the churches in Galatia is legalism. And we see legalism is not just a thing that uh, Paul and the other Christians dealt with and back in uh, this time chronologically, but we see legalism being very, very high, unfortunately on the Christian totem pole, hence forth and forevermore while we have uh, so many uh, denominations that have been raised up because I, I, you know, I, I'm going to be honest, when you, when you start to do some research and dive into a lot of these denominations, whether it's uh, Catholicism, uh, the Methodist movement, uh, Latter-day Saints, uh, Assemblies of God, you start to see some legalistic ideas that for whatever reason took off. They were attractive in the moment. They gained a lot of traction. And for whatever reason, they pushed people away from the truth of God's word. And I don't know why we go there because the word of God uh, by itself doesn't need our help. Come on and say amen. <laughs> like the Lord doesn't need our help to reconstruct or to add to what already exists. And now again, we've got this church where Paul says in the very beginning, he says, you, you know, who's bewitched you? Well, there's a level of witchcraft that you've allowed to enter into the church. You have a, le a level of witchcraft you've allowed to enter into your hearts. And now it's taking you away from the thing that I taught you early on when the Holy Spirit allowed me to come and visit you. And that was what? What was the thing that Paul taught them in the beginning that they strived, that they turned away from, they diverted away from? Simple word, one word, the what? The gospel. Okay, so the gospel message, which is, and we can't get away from it, is that there's a man by the name of Jesus, born of a virgin. He came into the earth. He lived a perfect and a sinless life. God would not be satisfied with the life of his son, except he be born or he die, excuse me, first of all, be born to eventually die for the sins and the depravity and the wickedness of all of human, the entire human race to board those sins on his shoulders and to be resurrected back to life. And Paul has been teaching this, that this is now how we earn salvation. Okay, gospel, faith, placing our faith in this reality. Now you've got legalism that's again crept into the church and the hearts of God's people to now they feel that they can earn or there's a certain level of works that they can do in order to earn salvation. Okay, you cannot earn your salvation. You can't work for it. Do we understand that? You cannot work for your salvation. It's not enough work under heaven that you could ever do justifiably in the eyes of an all knowing and an all seeing God that will say, yeah, I'll save you based on what I see. No, it's, we're, we're not saved based on the works that God sees, but, we're, but we're, we're saved and justified based off what God sees. What's the thing that God sees? That our faith, very good. We know that to be true in the law of justification in Romans chapter five, verses one and two. Okay, any questions, comments before we uh, get into the scriptures on tonight? Just wanted to give you, sir. If just by example. Yep. Um, for like the Catholic faith. Sure. If they go by the Bible, and, and how do they not realize that they're doing what he's preaching again? You know what I mean? Like by saying, Mm -hmm. Like, how do they not realize that he's addressing them specifically through 
Mm-hmm. If they actually go by the Bible, are they just blinded to it? Yes. Yeah. It's again, remember Paul asked the question and we'll go back to it. And this is just not for Catholicism. So, I, was saying, I was raised Catholic. And yeah. Looking back now, I can see, you know, they, they make, like you said, earning through like. Yeah. You know, Works. All the different, yeah, things like that. Yeah, yeah. There's some wickedness. And look, it says, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Who again, uh, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? He asked the question. So if Jesus Christ is the one who's been portrayed, how can you let something else like legalistic ideas and beliefs through any denomination come in and infiltrate your mind and heart in such a way that you're willing to turn your back on you on what you already know that's true and that exists? And that's what creates the the denomination. That's what lays out the legalistic laws that people think now subsequently that they have to keep in order to be great, to be saved, to be faithful, to be counted worthy in God's sight. And that's just not the case. We make the whole point and great, great uh, input, John, but we make this more difficult than it really has to be. It's simply placing your faith in something that you've never seen before. Nobody in this room witnessed Christ get up on a hill in Golgotha. Nobody. If you did, (laughs) we need to talk. All right. But to my knowledge, no one in this room or anybody watching this online has never witnessed Christ go through 30, 33 years and then get on the cross, die, be resurrected. We didn't witness it, but we have to place our faith in it. And I don't want to pick on Catholicism or any other denomination. uh, But again, that this is the detriment to allowing legalistic opinions, predispositions and different ideas to infiltrate and be laced with the truth of God. All right. Laced. Uh, You know, you know what that means. I definitely know what that means. All right. Praise God for Jesus Christ. All right. So we don't we don't want to do that. Anybody else before we get into the into the text uh, for tonight? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. To see what it was. And the most recent book of discipline for the United Methodist Church for the 2016 year was 912 pages yeah. of discipline book. And I told you know, Jason, I said, <laughs> don't you reckon we probably broke some of those? I mean, like, how, how do you know? Like, yeah. you know what I mean? We don't, yeah. I mean, you don't even know what's in there. Yeah. We don't even know what's in the Bible. Right? Yeah. 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 And we see it I, again. We're not going to sit here and, and turn this Bible study into pick on denominations. But you start to see what Jesus is doing, uh, which really points to the latter days that we're entering or that we're already in, is that he's exposing a lot of these denominations. He's exposing a lot of these church leaders who fall under these denominations. And now what, what it's doing for a lot of pastoral leaders and even church leadership is forcing them to make a decision. And it's not a easy. It's not a tough decision to make. Because again, we've got the word of God that already exposes the truth. All right, so it's very easy, I, I think it is, and when we get in Galatians 5 tonight, when we start talking about walking in the spirit and Christian liberty, that liberty brings about, uh, somebody said it last week, I don't know who said it, but it, it, it awakens a God conscience in you to be able to distinguish, again, like Leviticus 10.10, 10, it gives us the ability to distinguish between the clean and the unclean and the holy and the unholy. And that's what I'm seeing uh, here today uh, with a lot of this exposure. And and again, this is the Holy Spirit. Even before he left, before Jesus left the physical earth, he told the disciples that when the light comes, every dark deed that's done that misrepresents the kingdom of heaven, one king for one kingdom, didn't take anybody else, didn't take two kings, three kings, no, one king, one kingdom. One king, one kingdom brings one light. That light will shine so bright that the closer we come to the rapturing of the body of Christ, Jesus will continue to expose the wicked and the dark things that misrepresent the king of one kingdom. Does that make sense? All right. Anybody else? Great feedback. I love this. Any, anything else before we get into the verses or the scripture tonight? Amen. All right, let's go ahead and pick back up Galatians 
uh, chapter 4. Uh, we'll cover 21 through 31 very quickly. This is talking about two covenants. Paul says, tell me, uh, you who desire to be under the law, do you not uh, hear the law? And now what you're going to see here, he's asking the question, if you've ever heard of what allegory is, this is what the Apostle Paul is going to fall into. And what allegory is, it's a poem or a story that reveals a hidden and a deep, deep truth. And now through this allegory, what he's going to do is describe here in this allegory. He's going to give us the truths of these two covenants. And in retrospect, what the Apostle Paul is doing through this short story is actually referring back and we, you can go back and read it. Uh, but he's going back to the 21st chapter of the book of Genesis and looking at the story of Isaac and Ishmael. All right, here we go. Verse 22, for it is written that Abraham had how many sons? The one uh, the one by a bond woman and the other one was by what? A free woman. Okay. And I'm going to try to diagram this to where it, how the Holy Spirit drew it out of my mind, hoping in hopes that it would make sense to you. So we have the bond woman on one side and the free woman on the next Son, son. Okay, let's go back to the, the scripture. He, uh, but he, verse 23, who as a bondwoman was born according to the what? The flesh. And he of the free woman was born through what? Okay. Flesh. Promise. Walk with me. Which, verse 24, which things are symbolic, pointing back to the allegory of these verses. He says again, for these are how many covenants? There are two. The one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. Who is Hagar? Okay. Who is she the mother of? Ishmael. Let's go back to the scripture again. Mount Sinai, which I left out. Sorry. We can put that right here. Okay. That's one, that's one covenant. Verse 25, for this is Hagar in Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. Children indicates what? Right? Offspring, more than one. Verse 26, but the Jerusalem above is what? Underline Jerusalem above. Jerusalem ab above, the Apostle Paul is referring to what specifically? What is he making reference to in the text? That's right. Okay, it's the Jewish hope. Okay, so again, Above the above, and we'll put this on over here. Jeru, I can't spell. Jeru. Jerusalem above. We find in Revelation chapters 20 and 21. Okay? This is this is the promise. We talked about it the other day. We talked about the new Jerusalem. We was riding somewhere. We were talking about it. All right. But the Jerusalem above. And you go back and, and do some research in the scriptures. You'll find it. Then he says, but the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. Verse 27, for it is written, rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear, break forth and shout, you who are not in labor, for the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now we brethren as Isaac was the children of what? Underline children of promise. There's that, there's corresponding 
Uh, there's something going on between this and the previous. Now on this side, we have Sarah, who was the mother of who? Isaac. Isaac. Okay, and thank God for the promise. I don't know if your brain or your heart has ever went here, but mine's gone here. Because if this promise had never been answered, I just looked at that, that can and just made me laugh. Pray for me. I thought it was something else. I said, you, you. <laughs> no, nah, bro, you good. No, 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 you good. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Uh, man, that threw me off. <laughs> but we have, no, nah, I know you good. <laughs> the promise from Jerusalem above. But I thought about this. If God had not allowed this promise to be a faith through Abraham, then instead of it being the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it would have been the God of Abraham, Ishmael, and Jacob. You ever looked at that before? No? Yes? Maybe so? Okay, I'll leave it alone. Now we, brethren, as eyes that we are children of the promise, verse 29, but as he who was born according to the what? And then persecuted him who was also born according to the spirit. So we'll just put... Okay, so... There's a, there's a comparison here. And the Apostle Paul, the way the Lord uses him in this, especially when we get into chapter five, you're going to see that there's, there's still that natural battle. I'll draw some, some arrows. But there's that natural battle and then there's that physical battle. I say that there's a, a natural battle because the, the issues that this part of the world still undergo still stem back from this day with Ishmael. And there's still beef, drama, and issue, ish, big issues politically, uh, religiously, on that side of the world. But then on the other side, on the flip side of the coin, spiritually, and when we walk over here in Christian liberty, there's still war that wages not only in the natural realm, but between these two entities, Paul is gonna let us know that there's war going on in the inside of our hearts. Amen? All right. Verse 30, nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Verse 31, so then brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the what? Okay, on this side. And that's important that we see this and we see the comparison because right here, and we're gonna see this liberty in a minute, it's, it's understanding that we're not having to keep the law of Moses today in order to be saved. And now we've got people within the Galatian church that have now uh, diverted from that and have allowed uh, certain things from back on this side of the cross within the Old uh, Testament dispensation that they fell in love with in addition to legalistic ideas and beliefs that have now set them apart and they forgot what it means to be saved by faith and to live by grace. Does that make sense? All right, do we see the comparison through the allegory that, uh, that Paul uses in these verses? We good? All right, y'all quiet tonight. Everybody had a good day? All right, Dante, you looking sleepy. You good? All right, I'll come give you a hug and a kiss if you want. <laughs> Amen. No, oh, I can, a holy kiss. All right. All right, here we go. Chapter five. I love you, man. All right, let's pick it up at verse one. Christian liberty. Let me give you this, let me give you this verse. Second uh, Corinthians uh, 317. Anybody know that? The Lord, the Lord God is spirit. And that wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there's what? There's liberty. That's freedom. All right. this, is, this is really a good foundation when we start talking about liberty or freedom, whichever word you desire to use, liberty in Jesus. All right. And again, going back if our bodies, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, if our bodies are now temples of the Holy Spirit to whom we ourselves don't belong, 
and that we've been bought, the verse 20, you've been bought with the price, therefore glorify the Lord God, not only in body, but also in what? Spirit. Okay, so again, if our temples, and, we, and how do we receive the Holy Spirit? By faith, the same way we walk into salvation. Okay, and that's Ephesians chapter one, verse 13. It's important that we understand that because it's talking about legalism. There are legalistic ideas in certain denominations that believe that you have to do other things and not in conjunction with Ephesians 1.13 in order to actually be a recipient of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And Paul lays it out very clear that it takes faith. Now, going back to our liberty in Christ, think about it. If our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is a free spirit, then everywhere we go, we should also experience what? That freedom. So there's no, and, and listen, and I know contextually, the Apostle Paul is talking about not falling subject back unto the law, the curse that it brings. But as a free man or free woman in Christ, not even talking about the law, there's nothing that should have us in bondage. Nothing. Nothing. And, and here's the good news. If there is something that has us in bondage, Christ can set us free. Come on and say amen. amen. If you want to be free, you can be set free. Addiction, it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, whatever's looming in your heart, <laughs> Christ has the power to set you free. And this liberty is, is not just for certain Christians or Christians that only walk this way or been saved for this long. No, this is for everyone. Everyone should have access to this liberty. Let's get into the word. Galatians chapter five, verse one, Paul says, stand fast, therefore, in the what? Okay, we need to be standing. You want to be rooted in anything in Christ? It needs to be liberty. All right. It's the truth. It's where we ought to be free by which Christ has made us free. Who makes us free? Nobody else. So what has Christ done that makes us free now? Absolutely. So he took on a punishment and a penalty, Smitty, that you and I should have taken. Now he became the propitiation or the substitute for you and I. And now because of that, he's taken the punishment. He's taken it for us. And because of that, we place our faith in that reality. We can experience the liberty that can only come from Christ. This is good, y'all. Says, and do not be entangled how often? What does the scripture say? Again. So don't, 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 don't get entangled again. Don't get rewrapped. Don't let something that got you before get you again. With the yoke of what? Okay. Give me another translation. Yeah. All right. In other words, we shouldn't be slaves but to one person. Who is that? One master. And this type of slavery is a slavery, is being a slave by choice. <laughs> I choose to be a slave of Jesus. <laughs> Bond servant. I choose. I make that choice. <laughs> and I'm okay with it. Amen? Amen? He says here in verse 2, Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. What's going on here in verse 2? Okay. Okay. Somebody else? Somebody's telling them they got to be circumcised instead uh, in order to be saved. Which is physical, right? So somebody has to go through the ceremonial rite. And this is a big deal in the Jewish culture and Jewish community, especially when we start talking about law. All right. Even Christ, remember what happened to Jesus because he is Jew and was the king of the Jews. What happened when he was born? Okay, on the eighth, right? So he, he's been, right? So now, what we've got here, and let's go ahead and turn to Romans 2. Let's go ahead and get there. Let's go to Romans chapter 2. I want to show you something in conjunction to what Paul is talking about here in Galatians 5. So hold your place there. We'll come back.
Because as much as some in the church want to be circumcised here in Galatia, sure, it's a circumcision, but it's of a different body part. Let's look at the text. Romans chapter 2. Let's start at verse 25. Romans chapter 2, verse 25. For circumcision is indeed profitable if you do what? So a physical circumcision only becomes profitable if the law is the one that's going to be your school, your master or your tutor. So if, the, if, if that 900 and whatever, uh, I was gonna call her court, looking at you, mama court. <laughs> right, if you wanna keep all 900 and you, know, and you wanna do that, then listen, that, that's for you, Paul says, if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become actually what? Uncircumcision, the opposite. He says in verse 26, therefore, an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law. Will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? What's he saying here in this verse? <clears throat> I'm sorry. Okay. So God is what? He's, he's judging a person based on the state of their what? The, what's that? The ticker, the heart. Verse 27, and will not the physically uncircumcised, if he, if, that's the condition, if he fulfills the law, judge you even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law. He asked the question. He says in verse 28, for he is not a Jew, who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. Verse 29, this is what I want you to hang on to, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. So it's not even the act of what he's doing to his flesh, Paul is saying. He says, but who is inwardly and circumcision is that of the what? Okay, circumcision is that of the heart in the what? Not in the all right, so if there's anything that needs to be cut away, it's right here in our heart. Why? Why does the heart need to be cut away? What's, so, what's, so, what's the issue with the heart? Jeremiah 17 and 9. It's desperately wicked. Desperately wicked. I say again, the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful. Jeremiah asked the question, because it's this way, in fact, who can know it? And that's why I, I've always said, if you've, if you've had anybody that you love and you really care about them and you tell them to follow their heart, go back and apologize. Right. I see it all over, over media. Follow your heart, these cute little songs and da, 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 butterflies and follow your heart. Be careful. Following your heart might not take you to the place where the spirit wants to lead you. Are you hearing me? All right. Let's get back to Romans. We'll finish it up. Who is inwardly in circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but praise from who? God Almighty. And God is absolutely excited, I believe praises the fact that we will allow him to do a to do a surgery within us amen let's get back to Galatians chapter 5 verse 3 and I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the what Half of it, some of it, a piece of it, a third of it, a sixteenth. Entire law. Entire law. All right, has to keep it in its entirety. Then Paul goes on to say, you have become what from Christ? Estranged. Give me another word. No effect. Sep there you go. Alien. Alien. That's what I'm looking for. You become alienated from Christ. This is what, it, and this is hard, this is a hard ver. this is hard text for a lot of people, or I'm gonna say, man, maybe there's a lot, for some to really come to, come to grips with. And I'll tell you personally, 
uh, living in Japan for three years and really diving into the Asian culture, this is a real struggle for them and other cultures. Because traditionally within an Asian culture, they are taught all, I mean, from the time that they can barely talk until they reach our age is that everything is quid pro quo. It's this for that. They have a hard time understanding that they can accept Jesus Christ simply by faith through grace. They believe that, yeah, there is a high power and there might be a Christ. But even if there's a Christ, there's got to be something that I have to do to perform in order for him to save me for to eternity. It's hard. It's, it's a big struggle, it's a huge struggle for them. And it's not just them. It's a lot of other different cultures who have that struggle. It's good news that we don't have to do anything that we just have to believe. Amen. Isn't that good? We just got to believe. It's faith. Faith, 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 faith. Without faith, the Bible says, it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God, the Bible says, must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek after him. Faith. Hebrews eleven six. 6. Without it, you cannot please your God. Amen? Let's keep going. Comments or questions? All right, I'm going to keep pushing. You have become estranged from Christ or alienated. I love that word. You who attempt to be justified by the law. You have what? Okay, so you started out at grace. Grace was good enough to, to keep you. Grace was good enough to save you, right? We see that in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Grace was good enough in the beginning, but now the same grace that kept you, that saves you, and that follows you and really chases you and pushes you into the presence of Christ, you fell from that now and you've bumped your head. All right, you've fallen. You, 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 believe, you were standing right beside grace. You were standing on grace. Grace was the very thing that kept you and now you've fallen from the idea of what grace actually is. How sad is that? Think about that. Says here in verse five, for we through the what? We eagerly or we crave, we wait for the hope of righteousness. What is the hope of right? I want you to underline that hope of righteousness. What is the hope of righteousness referred to in Paul's letter? What is that hope of righteousness? The hope of righteousness. Justified, but to ultimately be, be freed from what? To be freed from what? Sin. And to ultimately never have to deal with it again because we saved and filled with God's spirit, but I don't know about you, sin is still an issue that I have to deal with on a daily basis. I'll be honest. You don't have to be honest. I'll tell the truth. I'll tell the truth for you. So that, that, that day ultimately is the eternal, that's that hope of righteousness. Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 56. And this is a state called glorification. Paul describes it in a twinkling, not a blink, but a twinkling of an eye when the very corruptible will put off the corruptible and put on the opposite, which is incorruptible, and the mortality will actually lay down mortality and put on immortality, okay? The hope of righteousness. That's, that's the ultimate, that's where we've got to be. And we eagerly really wait that by what? What's the scripture say? We wait it by what? Faith. By faith. See how we can't, see Tina, we can't get away from it. As much as we want to leave and abandon faith, you can't get away from it. It brings you into salvation. It keeps you all through salvation. And then it gives you the reason for the hope of righteousness. That's why Paul said again in the letter, we talked about it last week, from faith to what? From faith to faith. Faith is not just something that you need to get you in the door. But faith is a thing that you need to keep you along this race until you stand face to face with Jesus Christ. Come on and say amen. Yeah, righteous hope. I, I, not, not just heaven. 
You know, heaven is, is one, but now to be freed from sin. I'm freed from that presence of sin. That is the thing that becomes the issue. And Paul's going to lay it out real clear because there's still a battle here, Cliff. I don't get to say that too often. That's why I did that. <laughs> you, see, you see that subtle play on words. Man, you talk to your mama. She, man, she blessed naming you that. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, but, but see, there, there's a battle here. And that freedom has to, it's, it's permanent. So yes, heaven. Heaven, he yeah, heaven. But to be freed from the presence of sin, to not have to deal with it ever, ever again, completely glorified by God and freed from the presence of sin. Verse five, I'm sorry, verse six. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything or produces anything, but faith working through what? Okay, so this law of liberty that we see Paul talk about is actually the law of love, it's the same thing. So for us to walk in the law of liberty, we walk in the law of love. Faith works through love. And we know this to be true because we see Jesus Christ demonstrate love. <laughs> he did. The ultimate. I just don't think there's any greater demonstration. He does it. Then he says, verse seven, watch this. You ran well. Like, like you ran well. You, you, you did. But who hindered you from doing what? Obeying the truth. And there's hindrance. One thing that I pray for personally, and you don't have to do this, and I'm just kind of letting you in into my personal prayer time and my prayer, prayer life, but I pray that I, I, I ask the Holy Spirit constantly, uh, I don't want anything to hinder my walk. I don't. I'm very, very careful. I, I'm, I, I don't. I don't, I can't go back, brother, to where I came from. I refuse to go back from where God saved me from. I can't be, I don't want anything to hinder my wall. I don't want anything to hinder my relationship with Jesus. I don't want anything to hinder my anointing. I don't want anything to jeopardize what me and Jesus got going on. Are you hearing me? Should be the same thing in the natural. There should be nothing that should come th through this relationship that would jeopardize and hinder the fruitfulness of husband and this wife. It's no different in the spirit realm. He said, who hindered you? You were running well, but something along the way caused you to stop obeying the truth. Watch this. This persuasion does not come. So, so, so now Paul is turning, to, he, he's passing the buck. All right. He's making it very clear that this type of persuasion does not come from him who calls you. Simplify what Paul is really saying. It doesn't come, it doesn't come from Jesus. OK, so listen, don't don't put your mouth on the Lord and say it was the Lord who's persuading you not to obey truth. God has always from the very beginning wanted us to obey truth. Where do we see that in the Garden of Eden? <laughs> we see that in the very beginning of creation. Right. He wants us to obey the truth. Watch this. A little leaven does what? Mm-hmm. Somebody, somebody elaborate on that. Give me an example. Give me a natural example. Mm-hmm. A little bit of mud and a cup of water like the whole cup. Yeah, right. So we, this is, I think, where we get in trouble. We say, well, I can do, in our own minds, and I, let, me, let me apologize. I'm going to come back over here because I, 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 I didn't give you, and I'll go on record and say that I didn't pronounce this word correctly. All right? It's sarex is really what it is, and I called it sarx. But it's flesh. And I want to give you some, just a couple Literary, biblical, original language definitions. It says that we have a human and animal traits that incite 
or stir up. That's what that word incite means. Incite sin. The second one is no regard for depravity. And I want to give you a couple of those two of those, those biblical literary definitions to show you how nasty this thing really is. Okay? And we're going to see a little bit later, but this, this, this is an issue. The original language says that, that we have animal characteristics and traits that stir up sin in us. And I think where we kind of miss the boats oftentimes is we think in our own insightful, animalistic ways is that we can do it with moderation. I hear it all the time. Oh, I got it under control. I got it under control. I can do it I can, just a little bit. I, I can, it's, no, I got it under control. Jesus, I got this. That's what we say. Holy Spirit, I got it. It's under moderation. I only do it a little bit. I only do it so often. No, no, a little leaven leavens the entire lump. All it takes is a little bit to mess this whole thing up. That's why the Apostle Paul is putting a hyper focus on a little leaven. He's talking about the measure, reminding us that it, does, it, it's not, it doesn't take a, a large quantity for us to not and fall away from obeying the truth of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Verse 10, he says, I have confidence in you, though. So I got confidence in y'all. In the Lord. That you will have no other what? Underline no other mind. Okay. And another thing that I always pray for. Lord, renewing me a, a right spirit, <laughs> please, and renew my mind. Renew it. Because there might be something from yesterday on my mind that I don't need to carry into today. It's truth. We all have it. We, arguments, issues at the job, on the job site, beef in the family, uh, whatever it is. We, there may be something in your mind that we don't need to take over into the new day that God has given us brand new mercies. All right. So again, he says, I have confidence in you and in the Lord that you will have no other mind. But he who troubles you shall bear his what? Whoever he is. Whoever has, who, who's, who's brought this legalistic thought, telling you that you can revert back to the law, which brings a curse. You need to be circumcised of the flesh. You need this. You need to do this. Do, do, do. Do this, do, 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 keep this, work this, da, da, da. God's going to deal with them. Okay, they shall bear their judgment. And Paul says here in verse 11, and I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Paul then goes on to say, and that's a question. He then goes on to say, then the offense of the cross has done what? What's, what's going on in verse 11? Somebody elaborate. I'll read it one more time. He says, and I, brethren, Galatians 5, 11, and I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why, in fact, do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. Talk to me. Okay. All right. I have a thing here. It's talked about a scandal. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Elaborate. So it says that he was being accused of um, preaching circumcision. Okay. Um, and so obviously they're trying to make him look like that. Okay. Now remember, it's the cross that gives offense. Why? Because the cross claims God's unmerited what? We talked about it. Where, where did they fall from? They fell from grace. So again, the cross, it gives offense because it proclaims that unmerited grace. We can't forget that. And because of that, now it leaves no place for people to do what? For, for what? Boasting in works. So now it's no both. Now it's no look at works. 
because now the cross indicates unmerited grace and the works will never be greater than the unmerited grace of Jesus Christ. Then he says in verse 12, I wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. What is he saying? Right? Get out of here. And what Paul and what I want you to see is that there the legalistic teaching, it has a lot of spiritual it, not only does it yield spiritual consequences, but it but it produces a lot of spiritual damage. Yeah. I, I talked to a, a, a few people, not as many as maybe one season of my life, but a, a, a couple that I know that I talk with on a regular basis in private, they have they, they struggle uh, and they have a hard time. And even when you do a verse by verse Bible study and show them what the word says, they struggle because legalism has just beat them down so much. There's there's so many rules that they attempted to keep where they came from. So them, so when they hear the scriptures like what we do tonight, it's hard for their spirit man and open, or their spirit man and woman to be open to these truths because legalism has done so much damage. And then when they come to a place like us, they struggle. <laughs> and the struggle is real because of the damage that legalistic belief system has created. And now they're in their 50s and then their 60s and some of even in their 70s are now are almost like babes in Christ again because they're in a phase in their walk where they're having to unlearn and relearn. Why? Because again, Paul is emphasizing that legalism and legalistic teaching, it does spiritual damage. And only Christ can, can fix the wounds. All right, that's why it's so important that we make that distinction. He says here, for you brethren have been called to what? You got freedom. Y'all been called to it, but don't use your liberty as a what? As an opportunity for the flesh. Somebody, somebody elaborate on that point, on that scripture, on that verse. Yeah. Where we, where we find that? Find that for me, uh, Carrot. Paul asked the question. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Is it six what? Read it, please. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Okay. Certainly not. Certainly not. Shall we who died to sin live any longer in? Amen. Did y'all hear that? Very powerful. And again, it validates Paul's teaching. He's not teaching one thing to one church. Or one group of people and teaching something totally different to another group. And some of us, if, that, if that's your and if that's your take on, on grace, I would caution you to to not live that way. The grace of Jesus Christ does not give you the license to do whatever you want, because I can because I know Jesus is going to forgive me. Grace is laid out there so I can live uh, like a hellion and do what I want. Sex, drugs and rock and roll. It don't matter anyway, because I got grace that will cover me and keep me. Okay, that's good for a season, but what happens when grace isn't extended to you for that season? And then you do a thing thinking grace is there and then grace is no longer present. Why? Because you fell from it like Paul's talking about tonight. Don't play with the grace of Jesus Christ. Nothing to play with. It's free. It's there. It's unmerited because of the love that he has shown through the entire world through what he did on Calvary's cross. But again, Paul says in Romans 6, or Romans 6, 1, Certainly not. Verse 14, for all the law is fulfilled in what? One word. Even in this, you shall love your who? And we talked a little bit about that on Sunday. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be what? Be consumed by one another. All right. I'm going to read that again. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, and even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Whose words are those? Jesus Christ. Remember, he said to hang all the commandments on these two. What were they? And then this one, the second one to do what? Okay. Verse 15, but if you bite and devour one another, Beware, 
lest you be consumed by one another. What's going on here in verse 14? Listen, if we if we if we if we've got the energy to devour one another, let's take some of that energy and, and devour supernatural darkness. If any kingdom needs to be torn down, if any kingdom needs to be devoured, it's the kingdom of supernatural darkness. Uh, that if, if put our efforts and energies in that arena. We shouldn't have beef. We've got and I talked a little bit about it on Sunday. We got beef with one another. Like, like Christian gangs. You, you belong to this church and I belong to that church. You the rolling 60s and I'm the, I'm the grapevine crips and you the bloods. You know how stupid that sounds? That's exactly how we act in the church. We won't even fellowship with you because you over here and I'm over here. You red, I'm blue, you yellow, I'm black, you purple, I'm this. I'm tongue, you know tongue, I'm manifested spirit, you popularity. We just can't, we devour one another. And we wonder why the enemy has such a strong foothold in Christendom today in America. Well, the devil doesn't need to teach us. No, he, he doesn't. Yeah. That's it. Why? Because right here, it's in our nature to do so. And Marie brings up a very valid point. Nobody has to teach us to do wrong. It's already in us to do wrong. And I wish I had time, but I don't. But we'll get into this next week. That war that wages that nobody talks about. 